Do this with a salvation. Salvation tearing through the dead of night. See the kingdom burst into color at the speed of light. Freedom shaking up the atmosphere. As the shadows fade into nothing as the day appears Beyond the skies Beyond the skies above Love reaching out for us The everlasting word Jesus our God Yeah, sing it out Oh, we look to the sun Hope of heaven shining like the rising sun. Now forever lifted up from death to life. There's no fear in love and no darkness in his endless light. Amen. Beyond the skies above, love reaching now for.
is numb beside you. Lord, open up our eyes. May we, may we build on this foundation. May we stand in awe with our arms open, being willing to let you fill us with your love. May we not be ashamed to share it. Jesus, you are so, so good. It's in your name we pray. Amen. What is something your mommy always asks you to do? She loves me. What's your mommy not very good at? A little bit not good at drawing. She scribbles a little bit. What is something your mommy always says to you? Auntie says, I love you, Jackson. What makes your mommy proud of you? Um... A few moments later. Building blocks! I have Lincoln Log from my birthday when I got fart. What's your mommy's favorite place to go? A uh, church. What makes your mommy happy? A uh, cookie dust. What do you and your mommy do together? Dirt, dirt. I poop all the time. What's your mommy's favorite thing to do? Exercise. What is your mommy really good at? Mm, exercising. What does your mom like the most about your dad? Kissing mm, on the whips. Disgusting. What makes your mom happy? Miss my little pair. What does your mommy do when you're not around? She sometimes do work on a computer. What's your mom's favorite video game? My mom never really played ge video games, but I teach her how to play one. What's your mom really good at? Um, making dinner. Happy Mother's Day. All right, let's thank the moms one more time. Couldn't be here without you. And I, I do have just one beef, and that is as a single dad who's got to be both single dad and mom, I deserve both a cake pop and a brownie. <laughs> We've been on a series, as Becky said, called a Dealing with Regrets, Starting Over. And so far, as we looked at regrets, because we all have regrets, you have regrets, I have regrets, we all have regrets. And so far, we've talked about the importance of embracing your regrets, of, uh, of kind of realizing they're there, loving them more or less, uh, grabbing a hold of those, and realizing they don't have to define your life, but they can actually be used to kind of direct your life in a, in a new way, to recognize your regrets, to come to the point of understanding what is the re regret that I'm dealing with. And this morning, I want to talk to you about the importance of releasing your regrets, and so every, every weekend when you come into this place, if you're a guest with us, we always give you an outline. And that outline is just there to guide you through the message. And we always share a big idea. And this is the idea that, that drives the message. And so this morning, I just, this is a big idea for you today. And that is that the, re, the regret that I refuse to release will always have its grip on me. The regret that I refuse to release will always have its grip on me. A.W. Tozier, who I love A.W. Tozier, anything you can pick up by Tozier is worth reading and they're very simple reads and very good. He made this statement one day, he said, truth rests, truth rests upon the character of God. And when you think about that and you think about what God calls us to, God does not, is not calling us to, to know him afar. He's actually calling us to, to know him in a very intimate way. And what I've found is this, and that is that, that those moments when I've come more in tune with the character of God, when I've had to lean more into the character of God, have not, not been those seasons when I've been up here in the mountain. It's been those moments when I've been down here in the valley. It's been in those moments where I've, I have, my faith has been tested, where I've maybe walked through a season of suffering or a season of hardship along the way. And, and it's in those seasons that I've found myself growing more in my intimacy with God but also leaning more in on his character and the truth of his character. And, and the truth is, is that we really do, we find ourselves at the greatest point of dependence when we're walking through some of the most challenging moments of our lives together. And it's in those moments actually that we find ourselves at times even having to deal with some elements of regret. Maybe it's regret over something you did. Maybe it's regret over something done to you. Maybe it's regret because of a circumstance in which you find yourself being faced with and that you didn't, you really would prefer to kind of walk away from it. And yet it's in that season 
that God begins to demonstrate his love and his care and his grace to you as well and the depth of his character. I want to take a moment and this morning and I want to talk about a mom in scripture that had to battle her own regret and we're going to learn how she managed that regret and how that really can apply to our lives in whatever regret it is that you may be dealing with. And so if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Samuel. It's in the, in the Old Testament. Let me give you kind of a backdrop. The people of Israel have left Egypt and they've gone into the promised land. And so you get through that season of Joshua where the walls of Jericho came down and the people moving into this promised land. And then for about 450 years, some would say 480, some would say 410, so we're just kind of going to camp out there in the middle, about 450 years, there was a, there was a season there which, would be, which would, simply would have been called kind of, that, kind of that moment of the judges is what it was. It was a season of the judges, and God would raise up men and raise up women to, uh, to really guide the people of Israel, and, and yet in that season, what happened was is that the people of Israel would go through a season of being faithful to God, and then they would have a moment of sin and disobedience, uh, they would move into a moment of regret, which would lead to repentance and deliverance, and it would go over and over and over again. And so God decided to end it, and he was going to bring in a, a line of mon monarchy, basically to bring a king into play. And so he was going to raise up a man by the name of Samuel, who would kind of be the bridge between the judges and this new level of leadership through the idea of a kingship. And so Samuel has a mom, and her name is Hannah. And uh, Hannah is an incredibly faithful lady of God who battled a very long season of barrenness within her life prior to conceiving Samuel. And, uh, and God blesses her with, with this child, with this little boy, Samuel. Now, there's three characters in the story. Uh, not in the story, but in this historical event. There's Elkanah, which is her husband. There's um, Penina, which is, uh, which is his, one of his wives. And then there's Hannah, which is the other wife. And, uh, and Pania has it out for Hannah. And she makes Hannah's life miserable. And not only does she make her life miserable, not only does Hannah have to deal with this issue of this person outside constantly coming at her, but she has to deal with the internal challenges of regret by not being able to conceive a child. And, uh, and so God uses us in this moment of, of deep regret, I think, to really teach us what we can do with our own season of regret by releasing it. So here's, here's what scripture has to say to us. There was a certain man from uh, Ramathian, a Zophite, from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jerhoam, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. Say that three times really fast. <laughs> he had two wives. One was called Hannah, the other Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had none. And year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, and you can read more about them in the chapter, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. And whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Penina and all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her. And the Lord had closed her womb because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her, agitating her to a point of deep desperation. And this went on year after year. And whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. And her husband Elkanah would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are, why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than 10 sons? Isn't that kind of a macho thing to say? A moment of men are brokenness, I mean. But once, once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up and now Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house and in her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord weeping bitterly. And she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant but gather a son, then I will give him to the Lord. Give her a son, then I will give, her, give him to the Lord for all the days of his life. And no razor will ever be used on his head. And as she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Now, in, in those days, what, what historians would tell us is that when you prayed, you kind of prayed kind of liturgical prayers. They were prayers that, that everybody knew what you were praying. And, uh, and so that would be looked upon, okay, I know what you're praying because it's a liturgical type of approach and, and uh, kind of the same prayer that, that everybody would pray. But, but Eli observed her mouth and Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. I mean, it was a moment of just deep pain. 
I don't know if you've ever been there where you want to get it out, but you don't know what to get out, and, and you don't know what to pray in that moment. And that's kind of what was going on with Hannah, deep pain and regret. It says, Eli thought that she was drunk. And he said to her, how long are you going to stay drunk? <laughs> Put away your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. And Eli answered, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. And she said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. And then she went her way and ate something and her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning they arose and worshiped before the Lord and then went back to their home at Ramah. And Elkanah made love to his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son, and she named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. And so Hannah's got some things to teach us about what happens when we're finding ourselves gripped with regret. And I think in how she teaches, how she responds to it is the same way that we could respond to it as well. And the first is this, I want to take some notes. That is that when you're finding yourself gripped with regret, refuse to let bitterness take root in you. Refuse to let bitterness take root in you. Hannah's heart stayed tender because she refused to allow the pain of her barrenness and the relentless pounding of her ad adversary to destroy her trust in the Lord. There was a certain stigma that was attached to a woman who could not bear a child. And the belief of the day was simple. Barrenness was the result of sin in one's life. And so the rabbis considered barrenness to be a curse from God, an indication of sin or something spiritually wrong in one's life. And so here you've got Hannah, who's, who's living with this stigma that something was wrong with her, and that it had everything to do with sin or something deeply wrong within her life. And so she walked around carrying this deep sense of condemnation, which was even more intensified by the taunting of this ad adversary, Panina, on the outside. And so the text tells us that she wept, wept bitterly. Uh, first, you know, first Samuel 1.10 says, she was deeply distressed and she prayed to the Lord and she wept bitterly. Now she wept bitterly, but don't miss this. She wept bitterly, but she did not become bitter. She released the temptation of bitterness from her regret. In other words, she refused to allow the words of Penina and the taunting and the demeaning and the hurt to make, to make her into a bitter person. Some of you might be able to relate to Hannah on this one. It might, be an issue, might not be an issue of barrenness that you're dealing with. It might be an outside voice, someone in your life that, that is always demeaning you, is always cutting you down, is always pounding you down, and, and you can never get away from it. And, and, uh, and, and those words are taunting, and they're demeaning, and they're meant to hurt, and, and you're facing, you're kind of on that line of potentially becoming a bitter person. Look what Ephesians 4 says. Paul says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, Browling and slander along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. He says, don't let, don't let bitterness come between you and God and between you and someone else. Learn to forgive. Don't allow slander and, and malice to make its way into your heart. And instead, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. And, and what's true is, is that, that for some, maybe the reason why you feel so held by your regret is not because the Lord has turned his head from you, because he's not, but because you've allowed a point of brokenness and pain and regret to encase your heart with a root of bitterness. You have to make a decision. Am I going to become bitter or am I going to become better? What is it going to be? Um, I'll share with you a little story. Uh, you know, I, I have two moms. Um, my first mom, my biological mom, uh, was a remarkable lady. Uh, my parents were married for 36 years before she died of cancer. And she died of cancer my senior year of college. And uh, I watched my mom for seven years uh, walk through that journey of breast cancer, two, two mastectomies, uh, uh, not at the same time, but two separate times. And back in that time when a woman battled breast cancer, mastectomies were, were radical. They were horrible. The first one, she almost died in surgery uh, because of just what took place. And, and, and I, watched my mom, I watched my mom walk for seven years through her cancer with great grace 
and uh, with a lot of humility and with a lot of humor. I mean, uh, I could tell you stories of things my mom did in those seven years of walking through her cancer journey that at times we would go, Mom, please don't say that. Please don't do that. That's a little embarrassing on this one here, Mom. You know, And, and uh, I mean, just, just things that if you ever want to talk in private, I'd be more than happy to share that with you, but I won't share that with you publicly. But, but I watched that, and I watched my mom go through that. I watched my dad love my mom through that, through that entire journey. Uh, I watched the cancer just kind of riddle her, her entire body towards the end where her bones were just simply breaking as she was laying there. It was a horrible way to die. And I watched my mom die with grace. And I watched my dad walk with her. And then after my mom died, my dad's life just kind of fell apart. And I watched him spiral. And, and I, I, I just kind of observed what was going on in his life. And he had never done it before. I mean, 36 years with this woman that, that loved him. My dad came out of a lot of brokenness in his life. And my mom did a tremendous job of helping to, through, through the power of Christ, to bring some restoration, some healing, and some sense of balance into my dad's life. He wasn't a perfect guy, but he was a good guy. And, and, uh, but I watched my dad just, just really, he didn't know what to do with this. He didn't know what to do with his, alone, with his loneliness, with his brokenness with his pain, and so I watched my dad walk into a marriage that was disastrous, horrible, horrific, just about ended his life over it. And, uh, and then a few years later, um, he ended up marrying a lady that actually was in our lives when we were little kids, uh, and she came out of a, a very broken situation in her life as well, of, of tremendous loss in a different way than my dad did. And, um, and they got married, and for 14 months they were married, and my dad died of an aortic, aortic aneurysm, just very suddenly. And, uh, and so uh, when, he, when he met her, when, he, when they got together, um, the, how they met was they were in a Sunday school class. And, and, uh, and so I hope she doesn't mind t- me telling the story. She might be watching online. If you are, I'm sorry, but I'm telling the story anyway. So there you go. But uh, so, so she was in Sunday school class. My dad was in class with her. And she said, I need somebody who would be willing, I'm praying about somebody who would be willing to drive me down to Nashville who might have a truck and a trailer and, and bring back my daughter's stuff. I'd like to move her back home with me uh, in the season. And my dad said, well, I've got a truck and I got a trailer and I'll be more than happy to take you because William's guys are just very charming. They're in tune to those kinds of things. And so she didn't have a choice. She got in the car and they drove all the way down and she talks a lot. My dad didn't, t- didn't talk a whole lot. And she said she talked from Peoria, Illinois, all the way down to Nashville and back. And uh, my dad hardly got a word in. As a matter of fact, even on one time, he just looked over at her and he says, you know, you're awful cute when you talk so much. You know, again, that charm that came out. And, and, uh, and so they, they dated for three years and they eventually got married. And, and then there was that 14 month of together and then he died and I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do. What do I do with her? They, he died a few months before Laura and I got married and, and we just, we had her there as my mom sitting in the same place my mom would have sat and we just continued to, to get close to her and, and you know, I knew her, but I didn't know her all that well. And she's a remarkable lady. She's in her 80s now. She is a, uh, she's just a, a remarkable saint. I mean, she, she loves my kids. My kids love her as grandma. We, we enjoy being with her. She's just a wonderful person to be around. There's, there's no bitterness. She made a decision later in life as she came through her own brokenness. And, and she made a decision, I'm not going to become better, bitter. I'm going to become better. And, and, uh, and at Monday, I just asked her, I said, you know, tell me a little bit, because I, I, I was actually with her one weekend, and I didn't have the kids with me, and so we had a chance to actually talk, and we talked the entire weekend, and I listened to her talk the entire weekend. And uh, no, we just talked with each other, and, and I said, tell me about you and dad. What was it about you and dad? And she said, Ron, your dad kind of redeemed this idea of marriage for me. You know, your dad loved me and cared for me, and, uh, and walked with me. She said, I just, I couldn't think of, you, your dad even told me, you're too young, make sure you get married again. I couldn't think of ever being married to anyone else but your dad. I just, he loved me that well. And, and as I watched her, and I've watched her through this life, there have been those moments when, when I've seen her, and I've seen the joy in her life, and I've realized that even out of all the things that she's gone through in her life, in those 80-some years of life, the one thing that I've always learned about her is that, again, she made the statement went one time, I don't have time to be bitter. And so you have to make a choice. When you're going through a season of regret, am I going to become bitter or am I going to become better? Nick Vujicic, he was born without arms or legs. And in Australia, he's an Australian, and, 
And when he was 12, 13, he thought, what's life worth? And he contemplated killing himself. And, and, uh, and then someone got a hold of his life and someone began to talk about the value of his life and the fact that God created him, that he had purpose, he had meaning. He came into a relationship with Jesus Christ. He now travels the world telling kids and adults about the fact that your life does have value, your life does have meaning. And he talks about the issue of bitterness when he says, I've never met a bitter person who was thankful or a thankful person who was bitter. Hannah made the decision, I am, I'm going to release this regret. I'm not going to allow it to make me bitter. The second thing she did was this, is that she refused to let her adversary push her away from God. But she allowed the adversary to draw her near to God. That You need to let the adversary drive you near to God. Your problems can serve to move you towards the Lord, or you can allow them to drive you away from the Lord. And when you're going through a season where you're dealing with regret, the enemy loves to use that season to actually push you further away, to cause you to question God's goodness, to cause you to question God's faithfulness, to cause you to, to question the fact that God is interested in your life in this moment. And matter of fact, 1 Peter 5, 8 says, be alert and sober-minded. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion for someone to devour. Now, how does he devour us? Well, he wants us to sit in our regret to become gripped by our regret and create even more regret. And so he uses the problem to push us away from the Lord. He uses the problem to cause us to question God's goodness and God's plan and God's love and God's presence and his provisions. That he, that he makes us come to believe the Lord has forgotten about us. That he tempts us to forget about Jesus and what Jesus has done for us and the promises that, that Christ gives us within his word. And so we have a choice in the matter. We can feed on the lies or we can feed on the truth of God's word. We can distance, we can distance ourselves from the Lord, or we can draw near to him. So what do we find Hannah doing? We find Hannah in her moment of regret and brokenness, running to God with her regret, and she resisted the temptation to become bitter, is what she did. Matter of fact, when you look into her prayer in 1 Samuel chapter, uh, chapter 1, you look through that, that entire prayer, you look at how she came before the Lord and brought it, drawn near to him, drew near to him, that with the bitterness of soul, she drew near to the Lord, knowing he would draw near to her. With weeping and anguish, she brought it before the Lord. With offers of solemn vows, she brought it before the Lord. With persistence, with, with her heart, with all of her soul, with faith in God's promises, she just kind of opened herself up to the Lord. Said, God, I can't, deal with this. Only you can deal with this. And I'm not going to allow these outside voices and this inside voice to push me away from you. I'm actually going to push in close to you. So in your season of pain, you need to look for a promise and a purpose because what it does is it keeps you close to the Lord and it keeps you from growing bitter. It makes you better. When I was thinking about this, I thought, you know, what, what would be a story that, that we could listen to for just a few moments to, to learn how someone within this body used a season of great pain and great brokenness to allow it to be a season of drawing near to God, but also a season of, of promise and doing something with that pain in a very positive way. So I just want you to do me a favor this morning and welcome Mark and Delaney Ballman. Will you do that for me this morning? Y'all look great. So you guys have been uh, around Pathway for how long? Yeah, so uh, Delaney was born and raised in Fort Wayne, so she has been going to Pathway for 15 years. Wow. And so she's a, she's a lifer. Yeah. Um, I'm originally from Wisconsin, and we met uh, at Anderson University in college. And after we got married in 2010, we relocated here to Fort Wayne, and this quickly became my uh, church home, yeah. uh, and we've loved it ever since. Um, and then our story continues. We have four children. Uh, we have a four-year-old, a two-year-old, and really uh, where our story starts is uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, we, when Delaney was six months pregnant, uh, we uh, experienced a stillbirth, and we mm. lost that daughter. Her name was Rowan. And then uh, a year later, almost exactly a year later, uh, we were blessed to have our fourth child, Bo, um, and he will be a year this August. Yeah, so um, four kids, but one not with you. And so let's talk just a moment about kind of that season of 
regret or that season of brokenness for you guys. I know that six months, and uh, then you found out one day that Rowan was no longer alive, and then came that journey of several days of kind of having going to go through a process that was difficult, horrific, and all that goes with that. Um, and so, uh, Delaney, why don't you talk for a little bit about, you know, in that time, um, instead, of, instead of becoming a, a season of questioning, well, God, what are you doing? I mean, I'm sure there was a little bit of that as well. There would be. I, you know, it's normal. What'd you do with that? What, how'd that work itself out in your life? Um, so our two-year-old is a little girl, and um, Rowan, her and Rowan, were going to be a short 17 months apart, so we were really excited to see um, how their sisterhood and their bond would grow as they grew, um, and we fully anticipated that Rowan was going to complete our family, um, so we had a lot of regret when Rowan died um, and these unmet expectations um, for us and for our family and for our girls. Um, so it was, it was really a, a challenging season. Um, and, you know, we, even through the, the moment that I left the funeral home seeing Rowan for the last time, I just had this this unspeakable peace come over me about the whole situation. Um, and I think that Mark experienced that too. Yeah. yeah. It's this, it, we had talked about it a lot, is this weird peace that they talk about in Philippians that transcends all understanding. Uh, and it was weird. We still had that grief, that really uh, you know, ugly grief, all the things that come along with it. Um, and we looked at that and said, hey, uh, every time we feel all that anger, uh, the bitterness, the frustration, uh, that kind of does our daughter a disservice. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to, with God's prompting, to uh, bring some sort of good out of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were led there and got that peace, um, really by leaning on the truth of Jesus Christ, who he is, mm -hmm. uh, that we know that God loves us, uh, he's crazy about us. Um, he didn't cause this to happen. Um, and then also that we know where our daughter is. We know Rowan's in heaven with a much better daddy, mm -hmm. and uh, we're going to see her again someday. Mm -hmm. That's good. So, and, and this wasn't euphoric. I mean, you know, the reality is that we, we walked through a lot of tears, a lot of pain, you know, just a lot of brokenness, I and mean, we know that about that, but yet holding on to that. It is, it is and to, to hold on to the truth of God's transcending peace that is beyond understanding is that thing that, just it's it you just can't explain it because of, of what it does to empower you mm -hmm. and to support you in that season and to know that God you've got a plan in all this and so um, how did you take a season of regret and instead of becoming bitter how, what did you do with that mm -hmm. to allow you to become better so um, I just really was feeling a calling on my heart to serve other families that experience similar circumstances to us. Um, so we have started an organization, a nonprofit organization called Remembering Rowan, mm -hmm. and we serve to, we exist to serve bereaved families um, that experience stillbirth, miscarriage, and infant loss in Northeast Indiana. And um, we provide resources and also um, provide financial assistance for medical bills and funeral costs for those families. Um, we partner with an organization called Hope Mommies, and this is one of the, the boxes. And um, the Hope Mommies is a national organization that provides these boxes to hospitals and funeral homes, and they are filled with, um, there's a Bible and a Bible study and a book for um, fathers in there and some pampering items for the mom um, and also a handwritten note from another mom that has experienced loss. So these are given to families as they are leaving the hospital without babies in their arms. So um, that we just really think that um, in my experience in dealing with these families, they are searching for something um, and what a great opportunity to extend them the promise and the assurance of Jesus and the hope that their baby is well-loved and is in heaven. It's good. And then, so you guys are, to, really, you've kind of developed this non-for-profit called 
remembering Rowan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, coming alongside of families and showing the love of Christ to them in a positive way, kind of taking that season of regret and bringing about something of promise and potential to it as well. And it's been great. Uh, just uh, last week, we got the opportunity to deliver flowers on Bereaved Mother's Day, which is the week mm. before, because this Mother's Day can be really, really difficult for yeah. a lot of moms who are missing. Uh, so we have uh, three here on earth, and still there's the, the fourth that we don't have in our arms. And so we got the opportunity to go deliver flowers and a little handwritten note uh, to these moms who are dealing with the loss of a child or even infertility. Mm -hmm. Um, and the connection we were able to make with them was just, it was really sweet. And uh, you could tell how much it really meant to them that someone else was thinking about them and had their back and praying for them. Yeah. I just want to commend you guys for taking a moment of deep pain and bringing what you brought out of it. Being sensitive, listening to what the Lord has to say to you and saying, let's do something about this. And so we want to commend you for that this morning, first of all. So let's do that today. Um, and, you know... Maybe you want to spend some more time talking to them. They're going to be out in the atrium as well. And Delaney, can you do me a favor? Sure. Would you just pray? Maybe there's some moms and dads out here that have gone through loss. Maybe mm -hmm. it wasn't the loss of a child as an infant. Maybe it was the loss of a child as an adult. Mm -hmm. And the pain is still the same. Yeah. Can you just take a moment and just kind of pray for those moms and sure. those dads today? Absolutely. Lord, I just thank you for Mother's Day and I thank you for Rowan's life and I thank you for choosing me to be her mom. And I know full well that there are some aching hearts in this room this morning. And this Mother's Day doesn't look how they expected it to. Maybe their life is, is full of regret um, with regard to the loss of a child, or maybe they, like Hannah, are experiencing a season of infertility. And I just ask that you would just be close to them today. We know that your word says that you are close to the brokenhearted, and I just ask that you would make sure that they feel the peace and comfort of your love on this Mother's Day. And it's in your name that we pray, amen. Amen, amen. Let's thank these guys again, shall we? Good job. And so, uh, you know, as we talk about this issue of regret, there's another thing that, that Hannah does, I think it's, it's something that we can all do as well, and that is that she allowed her barrenness to actually birth a deeper dependence upon him. And that you need to allow your circumstances, your painful moment, your season of loss, your season of brokenness, whatever it may be, to, to birth a deeper dependence upon the Lord. In other words, what Hannah does is Hannah doesn't walk around like this holding on to it and gripping it. She walks around like this. She, she comes before the Lord with open hands, bringing her problems to him, and she just prays simple prayers before the Lord. One writer put it so well that if you tell no one else your problems, you have done nothing. If you tell someone your problems, you've done something. But when you tell God your problems, you have done everything. And so Hannah, she prayed a dependent prayer and a desperate prayer is what she does. And in the midst of doing that, she allowed the Lord to, to redeem her regret for her really next assignment. And that is of giving her son over to the Lord. The Lord, give me a son and I will give him to you all the days of his life. She doesn't pray for a son for Elkanah to work in the field. She doesn't pray for a son who will care for her every need when she gets older in life. She places her son in the hands of the Lord as well as keeping herself dependent on the Lord for her needs for the rest of her life. And the Lord used Hannah's barrenness to, to birth in her a deeper dependence upon the Lord. And the result of Hannah's persistence praying was the text just simply says, the Lord remembered Hannah. You know, what's that mean? Well, it means that he remembered to care for and to be concerned about her once again. She comes before the Lord with her hands open wide like a sail opens itself up to the wind carrying a ship along. I mean, it's, it's like this. It's, it's the reality that, that when you think about a sail on a ship, in order for that ship to move, those sails have to be open, and in many ways, that became the image of her heart. She said, God, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna open up the sails of my heart to you. I'm not gonna be gripped by this. 
I'm not going to allow bitterness to sink in. I'm not going to allow it to take seed in my life. I've got this outside voice taunting me. I've got the internal voices telling me what I am and what I'm not. But I know who I am, and I know who I serve. And so in this season of difficulty, I am just going to open up my life to you and ask you to lead and to heal and to guide. And I'll trust you with that provision. Some of you are in this space down here or online or upstairs in the venue. And maybe you're kind of going like this. And you've been trying to manage it on your own. And maybe on this Mother's Day morning, you just need to be reminded to do what Hannah did. And that is, that no matter what it is that you're trying to control or you're trying to hang on, you're trying to figure out, you're trying to, to manage you just might need to simply open up your heart like a sail and say, Holy Spirit, breathe on me. Speak to me. Heal me. Lead me. Guide me. Soften the hardness of my heart and have your way in my life to bring something good and better out of something that could be bad and bitter. So just think about that as you listen to this this morning. Falling is easy But staying in love is hard Hard to be honest Keep your heart open To be who we truly Without the facade There's no pretending Hearing your love, oh Lord, set me free Oh Lord, set me
season of regret, remember. Psalm 103 tells us, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Remember what God has done for you. Don't ever forget the work that Christ displayed to you of the depth of God's love for you on that cross. And in that season, remember back, maybe in simple ways or in moments of gratitude, how God has demonstrated his faithfulness to you. And the truth of his word that he never changes. Remember where God has brought what where God has brought you from. Maybe it was a, a dark valley, and God faithfully brought you through that. Maybe a season of personal challenge, a season of personal loss, maybe a season of reckless living. <laughs> and you surrendered your life to his leadership and to his lordship, and God brought you through that to restore you to heal you, to give you not only a new beginning, but a new future, and God using your story to do great things even in the lives of others. Remember who God is creating you to be. Doesn't matter the outside voices, what they have to say. Doesn't even matter what the internal voices might be saying to you that are going against the truth of what God's word says about you. When you surrender your life over to Christ, you become his son and you become his daughter and you become a new creation in Christ Jesus. And he's doing new things in you and through you. You might need to slow down enough just to be fully present with the Lord. You know, Hannah felt this intense pressure of the pursuits of her adversary. She felt the weight of her barrenness. She understood what weariness and regret felt like. But in the midst of that moment of deep intensity, In the present moment, she slowed down long enough just to be fully present with the Lord, just to open up the sails of her heart. Um, Saturday morning, about 3 a.m., I woke up to a dream, from a dream. Not to a dream, but from a dream. And uh, I won't tell you the dream, but I woke up and um, I found myself just kind of laying in bed for a moment. trying to figure out, God, what are you trying to say to me in that very vivid moment? Almost as if God was saying, just lay here and just be quiet. When do you take time just to remove yourself from the noise of whatever it is, just to be fully present with him? God, what are you saying? How are you leading? And then last is Release your regret before it takes its hold on you. Don't allow a situation to make you bitter. 
release it so that God can continue to make you better. Let's stand together, shall we? As I uh, wrap up the service this morning, um, I want to tell you that at the end of the service, there'll be some folks down front. I'd love to pray with you. If you're a guest with us today, we welcome you this morning. We're so thankful you're here. And if you'll stop by guest services on the way out, they would love to meet you. Maybe you've been here for a while, you're trying to figure out how do I get connected more deeply at Pathway. Stop by Next Steps on the way out as well. And as we pray this morning as a body, I just want to pray for Kurt and Annette Neal. Kurt and Annette um, watch online very faithfully at 11 o'clock. They're watching this morning. Uh, Annette uh, is battling cancer. They've just recently called in hospice and our team was with them last week. And um, I just want to just kind of from our hearts to your hearts, Kurt and Annette, we want to tell you we love you. Uh, We are doing our best to wrap our arms around you in this morning and just to let you know that, um, that we care And that in some way, maybe our caring is expressing to you the depth of God's care for you too today. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for your grace. And I thank you for these moments when when we have a tender time when the Spirit of God can just speak to us. And I pray for Kurt and Nett. And I pray that as they walk through this season, that Lord, um, you would just... Continue, Lord, to allow them to sense the hope that comes from you and you alone. I think of Steve and Laura, who are probably watching online too, and I pray the same thing for them, that as they're walking through that season, that they would continue to see, God, your presence in their life. And I think of so many that are in this space today that are walking through their own present battle that they may be faced with, and that they would just continue to bring that before you. And that, Lord, more than anything, for those of us that might be at a distance from you, that we'd realize that, God, you want us to draw close to you. You showed us the depth of your love and your goodness to us by sending your son Jesus to go to that cross for us. And Christ, you laid down your life for us, Emmanuel, God, with us, to be near to us, to rescue us, to redeem us, to forgive us so that we could move into a full relationship with God. Maybe someone in this space or upstairs or online this morning, they've never surrendered their life over to your leadership. And this morning in these moments, they would just simply say, Lord Jesus, I surrender. I open up my arms to you. I open up my life to you. I thank you for the work that you did for me upon that cross. And I ask you to forgive me. I ask you now to lead me as my savior and as my king and as my Lord. Lord, I pray for those that are hurting, that they would find their sense of healing in you. I pray now that as we've gathered together to learn from your word and as we get ready to scatter, to leave this place, to go to our homes and our neighborhoods and our workplaces and our schools, that we would take take the truth of what we've gained today, that we would allow it to work itself out in our lives, to transform us, to make us different, and that we'd become more aware to the people around us this next week, aware of the conversations we're having, the conversations we'll have, the people we'll bump into, and Lord, that in some way you might be able to use a portion of what we learned today to speak good news of the gospel to those who desperately need to hear it. We love you. It's in the name of Jesus that I pray. Everybody said, amen. Happy Mother's Day. See you later.